Hello and welcome to this Revision Monkey video on what's going to be in the 2022 Chemistry Paper 1 exam. This video covers the required practicals for AQA Chemistry and it's for separate scientists only. So separate scientists do one hour and 45 minute papers at the end of their course and this is for pupils doing the higher tier. So if you're a combined scientist, this is the wrong video for you. I need to go and look at the combined science one, as this one is just for separate scientists. And this is covering the required practicals for chemistry paper one. Do also look out in the description because I'll try and add some questions in there later on. And I'll also put in a link to the content for separate chemistry paper one, as the examiners have told us what to focus on. So this video is going to require, cover the required practicals that they've asked us to focus on and those are salts, titrations and endo and exothermic reactions. Salts required practical. So if you react an acid like hydrochloric acid with an, a base you will make a salt plus water. Now in this case the base we're using is copper oxide and we're adding it as a solid which indicates that it's probably an insoluble base, which it is, which means it doesn't dissolve in water. So we can't make it into a solution and add it, we add it as a solid itself. We're going to add that to acid and the salt that we make is this, it's the copper chloride and this state symbol here means it's aqueous which means dissolved in water. So if we wanted to make copper chloride, we need to identify that the acid we need was hydrochloric acid because they make chlorides and suggest a sensible base like uh, copper oxide uh, to react it with. So the first thing that you do for this practical is measure a fixed volume of hydrochloric acid, for example 50 mils, using a measuring cylinder and add this to a beaker. To that beaker, using a spatula, you would add copper oxide, but the important thing is that you would add it in excess, which means you keep on adding the copper oxide until no more will react and you have excess in the solution. You will notice when you have excess in your solution, because if this is our acid here, you will see that there's lots of uh, copper oxide or whatever base you're using that has not reacted. So we need to get rid of that. So the next step of our process is to set up a funnel with filter paper and place this in a conical flask. We will then filter the mixture so we will pour our mixture in here. The excess base that we don't need will collect in the funnel and then we will be left with our solution at the bottom. We will then pour this filtrate that we've got here into an evaporating dish on top of a gauze and a tripod with a Bunsen burner underneath. And we will heat gently from underneath using a Bunsen burner allowing some of the water to evaporate because if you remember from the equation above that we've just had, what we are going to make is copper chloride and water. So we need to get rid of this copper chloride, uh, this water, sorry, in order to get the copper chloride crystals on their own. So what will happen is some of the water will evaporate on heating, but what you don't want to do is let the, the, all of the water evaporate so it actually goes dry. You don't want to get it to that stage. You want to get it to that stage where you're going to have a little bit of water left in the evaporating dish. So then our final step is to remove this evaporating dish from the heat and place somewhere warm for the rest of the water then to evaporate from the dish and that will leave just our salt crystals behind. If you didn't leave it to evaporate slowly at the end you wouldn't get the crystals forming like you want. Okay. In your method as well, you can describe this part of the process as crystallization. Something that I'd like you to look out for is a question that 
on this practical a similar to one here which says a student wants to make copper sulfate crystals she adds some calcium carbonate to nitric acid she then heats it gently until all of the liquid evaporates write an improved method for this investigation so the thing I want you to look out for is whether they're reacting the right things together because you can see that they want to make copper sulfate so for this you are going to need sulfuric acid and they have wrongly used nitric acid and for the copper you will need some sort of base that has copper in it for example you would have probably got the marks if you just said copper itself as a metal reacting with it or if you'd put copper oxide or copper hydroxide or something like that really the best thing that you would want would be copper oxide however they won't penalize you if it does if the thing that you add together does make copper sulfate so you might have even put copper carbonate or copper hydroxide or copper something like that so that's what you need to look out for they've wrongly said that they're going to use calcium carbonate and then clearly the other mistake that they've made is saying that all heat it until all the liquid evaporates which hopefully you've picked up now that you need to um, filter it before you do that so you discuss how you'd set up the, the filter paper in the funnel and the conical flask and then you talk about not evaporating all the water but leaving it to evaporate slowly at the end okay so look out for that kind of question in the exam exothermic and endothermic required practical first of all let's remind ourselves what an exothermic and an endothermic reaction mean with an exothermic reaction, heat is released into the surroundings. That causes a temperature increase. And with an endothermic reaction, heat is taken in from the surroundings, causing a temperature decrease. So for this practical, rather than using a beaker, we use a plastic or a polystyrene cup because this is a really good insulator so it reduces heat transfer because we want to measure an accurate temperature change so in the reaction to get the temperature change we're going to measure the temperature after and take that away from the temperature before now if it's an exothermic reaction like I said that will be a temperature increase and if it's an endothermic we would see a temperature decrease so we would put one of our reactants inside the cup and then we would use a thermometer to measure the temperature before that bit's done then we will add our second reactant in like so and we will measure the temperature afterwards and what we normally do is measure the highest temperature that it reaches or the lowest temperature that it reaches depending on whether it's an exothermic or an endothermic reaction now this is all very well however a lot of heat can escape so what we need to do is we need to insulate the beaker the polystyrene cup and look out for this in the exam they'll talk about how you improve the method so you could for example put it inside a beaker of cotton wool you could absolutely put a lid on it, perhaps with just a small hole for the thermometer to go through. Those two things are really important. So in the exam, you could just be asked to set up an experiment like this to determine whether a reaction is exothermic or endothermic. Or you could be given a particular independent variable that you need to change. For example, the mass of one of the reactants or the concentration of one of the reactants or something like that. So I'm going to go through with you a step-by-step -step example whereby we're going to change the concentration of an acid and see how that affects the temperature change of a reaction. So we can measure 50 mils of a 0.1 molar hydrochloric acid using a measuring cylinder and add this to the polystyrene cup. We need to measure the starting temperature of the acid using a thermometer. Insulate the cap by wrapping it with cotton wool and placing a lid on the cup. 
add a three centimeter length of magnesium for example to the acid and observe the thermometer record the highest temperature the reaction reaches and repeat this for the following concentrations of acid make sure you list them in the exam for example 0.5 molar 1 molar and 1.5 molar and repeat the whole investigation three times and calculate a mean temperature change for each acid concentration and you should find that this one is an exothermic reaction so with our concentrations of acid this is what we are changing this is our independent variable we're measuring the highest temperature that reaches this is our dependent variable and we're going to use the same length of magnesium each time the same volume of acid so these here are going to be our control variables and we're trying to make our results more accurate by insulating the cup titration required practical this practical is for separate scientists only so with a titration we might be asked such a question as how much sulfuric acid do I need to neutralize 50 centimeters cubed of 0.1 moles per decimeters cubed sodium hydroxide so in the exam I don't think you get penalized whatever way um, you put it around if you're not given the question like this um, if you're asked to do one from scratch it doesn't matter so much but I'm going to put the acid in the burette and the alkali in the conical flask at the bottom so let's take you through step by step how to set it up so first of all this piece of equipment is called the burette and we would fill that um, with sulfuric acid until the meniscus lays at zero so if you ever pour it into a um, burette you'll notice there that it will curve and you want the bottom of that curve so that's called the meniscus sitting on that zero line then you need to measure out um, a fixed volume so I've just um, put 50 centimeters cubed because that's what this question said of the alkali using a graduated pipette so this one holds 25 mils so you draw it up until it got to the line on, on the measuring device dispense it into the conical flask and if I wanted 50 mils I'd have to do that twice add a few drops of phenolphthalein this is the indicator that we are going to use sorry so this was our graduated pipette this here this is the indicator we're going to use and add a few drops of phenolphthalein to the sodium hydroxide in the flask this will turn pink because it turns pink as a, when it's in an alkali place the conical flask on a white tile so that will just help us easily identify the end point of the reaction later on drop by drop add acid from the burette to the alkali in the conical flask by opening the tap on the burette and swirl after every drop so we'll be dropping the acid into the conical flask by opening this tap and by hand just swirling it as it goes in so this process of adding the, the acid drop by drop into the alkali does take a long time so what scientists tend to do is do a rough titration first whereby they'll be more liberal with opening the tap letting lots of acid go through as they swirl it and then they'll record a rough end point when they then repeat that titration they can do um, larger amounts of acid until they get towards the end point and then they truly would do it drop by drop until they got a really accurate end point for the titration when the acid completely neutralizes the alkali there will be a permanent color change from pink to colorless that's the end point of the reaction for this indicator and then we can read the volume of acid dispensed by the burette so let's say the acid went all the way down to there we would read that volume off of our burette 